The practice of Mahamudra meditation is simply learning how to observe the mind. As with all these meditations on the mind itself, they are so excessively easy to talk about that people think it cannot be this simple. We always imagine that a practice must be extremely complex and difficult. Otherwise, how can it work? But in actual fact, the essential practice is very simple. Talopa said to Naropa, Naropa said to Mapa, Mapa said to Milarepa, Milarepa said to Gampopa, and Gampopa said to everybody, just observe the mind without distraction. Now if you think about it, that's the one thing we very rarely do. How often during the day do we actually observe the mind? We are so fascinated by the input from our senses, and our senses here include the sixth sense of the mind, with its thoughts, memories, conceptions and emotions. We are so caught up in what we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we think, what we feel. But we never observe. Very rarely do we stand back and question the knower. Because we're so fascinated by the known. If we look at the mind, it will automatically split into two. There is the observed, and then there is the observer. Now normally we're so fascinated by the observed that we don't turn the spotlight around and look at who is observing. We're not even conscious of that. In the moment that we are conscious of being conscious, it's as if a light turned on in our minds. But in that moment of being conscious of consciousness, again the problem is that we begin to think, oh right, now I'm aware. Now I'm really aware. Now this is really awareness. And we've lost it. Again we are thinking about being aware. So we are no longer actually aware. Because genuine awareness is non-conceptual. It's not thinking. It's that consciousness prior to thinking. This is the essence of the practice. If you don't understand this, you won't get anything else. It's that level of consciousness which is always above and behind all of our thinking and feeling. Without it, we would not be conscious. It is consciousness itself. Normally when we think, we are totally immersed in our thinking. When we have emotions, we are totally immersed in our emotions. This is me, right? When we have memories, when we have thoughts, we are totally immersed in our memories. These are 
my memories. This is who I am. This is what happened to me. This is what I think. This is how I feel. We completely identify with that. When we are angry, excited or depressed, when we are elated, we are completely submerged in and identified with those thoughts and feelings. This is why we suffer. We suffer because we are completely identified with our thoughts and feelings. And we think, this is me. This is who I am. And because we are completely submerged in our emotions and our thoughts and our ideas, because we believe in them so much, they have become very solid, very opaque. And so if they're sad thoughts, sad memories, sad feelings, then we think, I'm a sad person. If they are happy thoughts, happy memories or feelings, then we think, I'm a happy person. So we go up and down like a bottle slapped around on the ocean. Sometimes we're up and sometimes we're down. It is the nature of the mind that thoughts are like waves and waves go up and then they crash back down again. And then another lot come up and another lot go down. But because we have no control, because we are so completely swept away by our feelings and our thoughts and our memories, and we're so completely immersed in them, therefore we suffer. But it's not a matter of having no thoughts or feelings, no emotions or memories. The thoughts, the feelings and the memories are not the problem. The problem is that we identify with them and we believe in them and so we are controlled by them. It's the nature of the mind to produce thoughts and emotions. What we need to do is to learn to ride the waves of our thoughts as they arise and subside. If we cannot ride the waves of our emotions and thoughts, we will be submerged again and again. For this reason, we first have to practice on calm water. This is the point of shamatha practice, or the practice of tranquility. We need this quality of calm awareness, of simply knowing. We are standing back and observing the thoughts and the emotions as just thoughts and emotions instead of my thoughts or my emotions. Just as mental states, which like waves, rise up, stay a little bit and go down.
when we have that quality of detached observance, which is non-judgmental and non-conceptual, then whatever happens in the mind is part of the display. What we're trying to do is simply to know the thoughts as they run through. Not favouring some and rejecting others, but just observing how the mind flows and that each of these thoughts, however powerful some of them might be, in their nature are just empty bubbles. While we're sitting in formal meditation, we shouldn't favour one thought over another. During the day, we can be careful to cultivate the positive thoughts and transform negative thoughts. But when we're just sitting in formal meditation, then we shouldn't favour one kind of thought over another. We should just recognise They're all thoughts, empty phenomena, rolling on. A thought isn't a thing. It's just an impulse of energy in the brain. So we don't need to grasp at some and reject others. We just have to be aware, spaciously, not tightly. We're not trying to fabricate anything. We're not even trying to fabricate concentration. We're simply relaxing the mind. We're not forcing the mind into a mode. We're just opening the mind to be completely aware. Whatever thoughts arise, simply recognise them. That's all we have to do as thoughts come up. We're not trying to stop thinking. Thoughts are not the problem. The problem is our lack of awareness. As long as we recognise the thoughts as they come up and disappear, we're doing it correctly. Zogchen meditation, and also to a certain extent, Mahamudra meditation, normally depend on the prior recognition of the nature of the mind. This is one of the reasons why in those traditions the Lama is important for pointing out the nature of the mind. But even without that, because the nature of the mind is our nature, we can discover it for ourselves. We don't have to wait for someone to point it out. So we are first trying to get a direct recognition of the nature of the mind. My Lama Kamtrul Rinpoche said that once we realise the nature of the mind, then we can start to meditate. Because the whole point is that once we've recognised what we're looking for, then we can start to open up that glimpse and make it longer and longer. The stronger our mindfulness, then when we do recognise the nature of the mind, the longer we will be able to sustain that. 
because the mind is well trained. If our mind is wild and all over the place, then even if we get a glimpse of the nature of the mind, we won't be able to sustain it. It will just be a glimpse. If our mind is well trained, though, through mindfulness, then that will be of enormous benefit for recognizing our unborn, pure awareness and being able to sustain that. It is said that within the spacious, open mind, thunderclouds can arise, rainbows can arise, flowers can fall, but it doesn't affect the spacious, open nature of the mind. That's the point, that you don't go up and down. It's not a big drama. That's what all of this is about. It's about coming back to our fundamental naked consciousness, which is nirvana. It's a total revolution in the consciousness from our usual ego-bound, sense-oriented way of perceiving to this open, spacious clarity, which is naked. It's naked because we're not colouring it with anything. We're seeing how things really are and not how it's presented through our distorted lens of our egocentric consciousness. It's a whole other way of seeing, and we don't have anything in conceptual language to explain that. Because conceptual language can only explain things from a conceptual point of view. So therefore the Buddha didn't talk about it much. He said, when you get there, you'll know it. Until then, anything we say distorts it. Whatever name we give to the ultimate reality, it's just a name. It's not what it is. And immediately our conceptual mind tries to grasp it and make a picture. But it's not that. It's something beyond what our conceptual mind can grasp. 